It really is a privilege and an honor to have Bishop Cooper. He is our, like Dan said, our Church of God state overseer. Um, his vision for the state is just remarkable. He's such a humble man, too. Um, and uh, I, don't, I don't know that we could have it better. I mean, I said in the first service that uh, all of us on staff here just love being under Adam because he's so easy to, to serve. And like you go up to the state level and you have someone like him and it's like, man, we have it good. So Bishop Cooper, thank you. I'm going to take Joe with me to introduce me all the time. That, that's pretty good. <laughs> Who's that guy he's talking about? No, and those people, did, did they tell you I paid them? <laughs> we did have a great time in first service, and I'm glad you're here for second service. Adam, Brian, Erica, y'all enjoy. Every time I come, it snows. So... <laughs> If you book me in July, we're going to expect snow. No. I love you, and I'm honored to be uh, the overseer um, in the Church of God over Pennsylvania. Um, I'm a son of a Baptist preacher. I was raised in the Baptist church. And for me to be here in the Baptist church, we would call it an anomaly. But in the, in the Pentecostal ranks, we would call it a miracle. Uh, for a guy like me to get to do a job like this, and I'm serious. Um, all my life, God has been faithful. I don't know why I'm his favorite child. But I am. If I need something, he gives it to me. If I want something, he gives it to me. That's pretty good. He's a good, good father. And the devil's a bad, bad devil. Um, is it Chelsea? Is she here? Is she here this service? No, she's not here? Well, she rocks. Her testimony is powerful. And we've been sharing that um, via Facebook and uh, with friends. And we're really expecting God to, to raise her up as a voice against Abortion in America. Every second that ticks off the clock, a baby dies in the world. Every second that clicks off the clock, a baby dies in the world. And so we're praying for her that God will just continue to give her strength and a voice. And I just speak this. It's going to open doors for her. It really is. And it's also going to open doors for this church and for Pastor Adam and uh, for this choice, uh, for this church to be a voice, not only in York, but in Pennsylvania and around the world. God's going to do that. Give God praise for that, would you please? <laughs> Turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy. It's page 296 in this Bible over here. I have it on my iPad, so I don't have a page number for you. But if you go to Genesis, turn right. <laughs> and go through the numbers, yeah. Someone said, is numbers important? Well, they are to God. He named a book numbers. So I think numbers are important. But uh, Deuteronomy 32.9, and I just want to say while you're finding that, uh, your pastor, Adam, serves on uh, the state council in Pennsylvania, the Church of God State Council. He is one of my council members. And I love him, and I respect him. He prayed for me about two weeks ago for my knee. Uh, I was in a knee brace, and I was uh, taking 1,000 milligrams of Vimovo, is what it's called. Uh, it has some real strong uh, uh, arthritis medicine in it, but I haven't taken a pill since. You see my hello? Come on, give God praise. I mean, you know, your pastor's a courageous guy. He just believed, and you know what? He didn't uh, shun die, but you know, I was raised Baptist. But you know, some Pentecostal people are really demonstrative, you know. Whoa! I mean, you know, and all that. I, there's nothing wrong with that, you know. But I mean, he just laid his hand on my knee, prayed for me, and guess what? I went home, I took off the brace, and I stopped taking my pills. Because I believe that the prayer of faith shall heal the sick and raise them up. Do you believe that today? Well, come on, give God glory. One more time for a pastor like that. I mean, that's the kind of people I want around me. 
Now, I have two sons, physical sons. that are mine and my wife, Kathy. We have a granddaughter. We have two daughters-in-law. Uh, our oldest son, Paul, leads worship at Herod's, Heritage Fellowship in Kentucky, in Florence, Kentucky. They gave us our first grandchild a year and a month and a couple days ago. And uh, her name is Cotton Lee. And she is a doll baby. We love her and we thank God for them. They just waited 14 years to have her. That's the only complaint I have. Um, our youngest son is on staff, him and his wife, um, and, they, and her name is Mackenzie, and they are in um, the Charlotte area, Gastonia, North Carolina. He's on full-time staff uh, at a church of God there uh, under, under his father-in-law. He serves under his father-in-law. So we're very thankful um, for God and for him calling our children in the ministry. I mean, it's powerful. I'm a son of a preacher. I've been called son of a lot of other things, moving right along. <laughs> But Deuteronomy 32, verse 9. Say there's revelation in God's word. Say that. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard anyone preach from this or not, but it's, it's something. Uh, I, I was going to speak on God encounters. I'd already told Pastor Adam, I'm going to speak on God encounters. Last night when I was walking the dog, as I was coming in the door of the house, the Lord said, I want you to minister about the eagle today. I said, okay, I will do it. So for the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in a wasteland, a howling wilderness. He encircled him. You know, Psalms 5, verse 12. If anybody asks you, do you have a word from the Lord for me? Give him Psalms 5, 12. He surrounds the righteous with favor as with a shield. Amen. You know, I mean, if you don't have nothing else to say, say that. Amen. He encircled him. Isn't that powerful? I don't know about you, but I love it because I know I'm surrounded by him. It's powerful. He, he encircled or surrounded him. He instructed him. That means he gave him wisdom and knowledge. Paul Young, he chose book, The Fourth Dimension. If you want to understand how Jacob had so much insight into understanding uh, the way animals think, do you remember uh, when Laban told him, you know, all the spotted ones are yours and the striped ones are yours? He would lay rods down in the, the watering trough and also in the, uh, the feed trough. And any time that they would, the animals would conceive, they would have spots and stripes on them. Paul Youngie Cho calls that the fourth dimension, that God gave Jacob insight uh, of wisdom into the fourth dimension. That's, that's pretty rich. Just think about that, and I'll move right along. Selah, okay. He kept him as the apple of his eye. You know the amazing thing about eyes? If there's a dust storm, you can blink so fast that the dust can't penetrate. And your eyelid is so sensitive to the apple of your eye, to the center of your eye, the retina of the eye, that it will do all it can to keep anything out. That's how God looks at you. Isn't that powerful? He protects you like the apple of his eye. Now, that's Jacob, and then he compares, prophetically parallels, the life of Jacob, which is also the children of Israel, with an eagle. And this is what he says. As an eagle stirs up its nest... Hovers over its young. You see that? I'm not really a good hoverer. I think hovers like a helicopter hovers, you know? But the blade on the helicopter's making it stand there, okay? Or be suspended there. Spreading out its wings. Taking them up on the wing. Don't, don't think that the eagle takes a... Do you know an eagle can take those pylons and rip and cut all the way through a human bone that's how much power is in that tylon in an eagle so the eagle don't lift its eaglets with its tylons she has them get on her wing and they clamp onto her wing that's what he's saying stirs up the nest hovers over them pulls out her wing like this so that her eaglets can hop up on it so the Lord alone did lead him, and there was no foreign God with him. 
I'm going to share this part of my story with you. I was pastoring the Baptist church. God wanted me to be spirit-filled. Things were comfortable. Uh, my father had been in the denomination, the Baptist denomination that I came from. It's Old Hard Shell United Baptist. And so I was pastoring one of their churches. But God had bigger plans for my life. I was raised in that church, very comfortable. I, I, listen to this. The church that I pastored, I met my wife in that church. I mean, this church was dear to me and still is. I love that church and I love those people, okay? They're good people. In fact, I know they're saved. That's what they taught us. That, in fact, we're eternally saved. I mean, you know, no, never worry about salvation. That was paid for. You know, you're good. But God didn't want me there. God had other plans for my life. I've literally preached uh, South America, Europe, and different places in the world. And I would have never done any of the things that I've done staying at that little church. And I know that. So God had bigger things in store for my life. And so what he did, he made me uncomfortable there. I started reading in scripture that my life wasn't the life of a New Testament believer. Uh, this is going totally different than what I thought it was going to go. My grandfather had a dream. I was cutting timber. You know, we got hardwoods here in Pennsylvania. Um, I'd gotten out of the army. I'd gotten a real good job um, at one place. But I lost that job and I had to go start cutting timber for a living. It's a hard job. Well, I've always believed in dreams. Even as a Baptist, I believe that God used dreams. It's funny, we're talking about Jacob and Joseph, the dreamers. But my grandfather had a dream that I got killed while I was cutting timber. And it shook me. He called me. He actually had my Aunt Bertha call me. And Bertha said, Grandpa wants to, Daddy wants to talk to you. I said, okay. Put Grandpa on the phone. He said, I want you to be careful. I had a dream that you got killed. Now, I'm pastoring the Baptist church. I'm saved and on my way to heaven. I just didn't want to go there that day. I mean, you know, I, mean, I want to go to heaven when life's over. I, I just don't want to rush the process. And so uh, it, I will tell you, something happened to me. I started reading Psalms 91, you know. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say the Lord is my strength, my rock, my refuge. I mean, I, I, mean, I was quoting that, man. I'm walking through the woods carrying a Super XL 925 home light and an 056 steel. But fear was gripping me. How many of you know God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind? So I realized that there was something missing in my life and experience. I realized that I should not be afraid. And so through this process, I thought, I'm going to the Bible. There's something that I don't have that I should have so that I won't be walking in fear. And I found out it was the Holy Ghost that I preach against. I preached that Pentecostal people were of the devil. Now, I pastored in Church of God for 25 years. I've met some Pentecostal people that were of the devil. But not all of Pentecostal people were of the devil. That's just a few. And I'm here to tell you, I was persecuting something that I didn't understand, know anything about. In fact, it would almost be considered blaspheming today if someone would do that to me. And say that, that it was of the devil. But God forgave me of my ignorance because I did it ignorantly. And so in this process of time, he made me very uncomfortable. I went, I left that job, went to work sacking groceries at a, a grocery store when Kathy was pregnant with our oldest son, Paul. And because I'd had such a good job before, it was really hard for me to find a good job. Nobody wanted to give me a job. And so her first cousin gave me a job sacking groceries at night. And I had two Pentecostal preachers come through the line. And they asked me a question that changed my life. They're witnessing to me. They're trying to win me to the Lord. I thought, praise God. They said, are you a Christian? I said, oh, yes. I said, I'm a Baptist pastor. 
And that one Pentecostal preacher looked at me and he said, was you raised that way? It was like a dagger stuck in my spirit. And so at break time, I went outside and I looked up to heaven. I said, God, am I Am I Baptist because I was raised Baptist? Of all things, God, if I was, if I was raised Pentecostal, would I be one of them? <laughs> if I was raised Catholic, would I be Catholic? Methodist, would I be Methodist? A am I am what I am only because I was raised that way? Or God, did you really do something in my life? And man, it started me on a journey. So I started seeking for the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And I didn't know any Pentecostal people. Kathy, my wife, who I love, we've been married 40 years. We celebrated 40 years. Isn't that awesome? She thought I was having a nervous breakdown. She's a good Baptist girl then. Honey, you, you're okay. You know, we got everything, just like I'd always preached. Like you've always said, you get everything you need when you get saved. How many of you know you can't just beat the enemy with a helmet? You need the whole armor of God in your life. So God used that whole uncomfortable part of my life. I had to turn my credentials in. Because I'm, I'm one of them tongue-talking devil people now. And I respected those people too much to cause confusion. So I resigned my Baptist church and I went to the moderator of the conference and I gave him my credentials. And his wife, his name was Estel Hopkins. His wife was Marie Hopkins. She bounced me on her knee when I was a baby. I mean, these people love me. And I'm leaving them. I had no idea where God was going. I didn't care. Honestly, just reckless abandonment. God... You know, they, they used to sing that old song, where you lead me, I will follow. Here I am, God. I had no idea where I was going. I just knew God changed me. And I didn't want to hurt them. And I never, I didn't uh, say, well, you all don't have what it takes. No, 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 no. I just said, I love you. I respect you. But uh, God's leading me in a new direction in my life. Here's my ordained bishop certificate. I didn't have a place to preach. Me and my wife were song evangelists. We would go sing in churches, and they would want me to pastor them. A church Christ Christian Union, want, Christian Union wanted me to be their pastor. After church, man, they called a church meeting. They called me downstairs and said, we want you to be our pastor. I said, no, you don't. <laughs> I mean, I needed a job. We didn't have any money. Hello? We had a baby. And, and I, I was barely making any money at the grocery store. And I was a supervisor at National Mines in Greenup, Kentucky before God started stirring my nest. And I told him, I said, well, I have the Holy Ghost and I believe in speaking of, in other tongues. And they said, you're right, we don't want you as our pastor. <laughs> <laughs> you know how easy it would have been for me to say, oh, yes, because they had a nice parsonage, they had a nice home, they paid a good salary. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God and the salvation to those that believe. And I'm telling you, I knew God had something, a destiny for me that I had to get to. As the eagle stirs its nest. So we were all born into the kingdom of God. Our father, God's been referred to as an eagle many times. As the eagle stirs its nest, this is God. This is God talk. He's comparing himself to an eagle. I mean, that majestic bird. Uh, let me give you an idea of his eyesight. If you had a business card, and you, uh, uh, if you had the keen sight of an eagle, you could read a business card at 100 yards. It's unbelievable. They can soar. They got shutters on their eye. And they can go just as fast toward the sun as they can speed down to the earth. They mate for life. The mother and father both raised the eaglets. It's not a one-person a one show. It's husband and wife. It's male and female, just like God created us. Somebody say amen. amen. But we were born into the nest. Say that. Say I was born again. Say it. Say I'm born again. We're born, you know, in that nice big nest. And, uh, you know, I talk about the only natural enemy of the eagle is the serpent. 
And so when they build that big nest, and, a, and the eagle's nest is about six foot across it. And underneath, the bottom layer is all briars and thorns and glasses and jagged sharp rocks and flint. That keeps the enemy away. However, out west, the eagles can get up high enough that the serpent can't touch them. Because above the tree line, there is no snakes. If you've never been out west to the Rocky Mountains, you owe it to yourself to make a visit to Glacier Park. It's one of the prettiest places in all the earth. If you're a fly fisherman, you can do the North Fork, the Middle Fork, and the South Fork of the Flathead River. Some of the greatest fly fishing in the world. If you can go down on the southern part of it, you can go to Spotted Bear, which is one of my favorite places to fish in the Flathead area, right outside the park. One of my greatest remember, or memories from being out there was as we went to Avalanche because we couldn't get up going to the Sun Road because it was closed off because of snow. There was a man with a telescope. And I asked him, I said, what are you looking at? He said, well, come here. And he allowed me to look through his telescope. And at about 7,000 feet in a cleft of a rock, was an eagle's nest with two eagles standing outside and little ones on the inside. Eaglets. It's beautiful. You talk about majestic. I mean, just breathtaking. Not a picture I've seen can express that. He said, I've been coming here for seven years. And he said, every year they use the same nest. And he said, every year they have at least four. He said, sometimes one of them die. If it falls out of the nest, they die. So there goes your theory on eternal security. <laughs> you know? you got to stay in the nest until God gets you out of it. So what happens? How many of you know eagles were not destined to stay in the nest? As beautiful as that spot is on the side of the mountain, they were not created to stay on the side of the mountain. They were created to soar with God. So there's a process. Say process. There is power in process. So the process is like this. Everything's going good. Mama comes by. She brings her food out of her mouth into their mouth. And everything's peachy keen. Praise God. Hallelujah. I love you, Jesus. All is well. And one day they think Mama's mad. Because she tears up the house. She starts pulling out all that soft down. All those pelts. All that skin, everything that was protecting them from all those briars underneath them. And they look up at mama like, what did we do? You ever been there? God, if I'm in your will, then why in the world am I going through this? I've said that. Have you? More than once in my life. I don't, God, I don't understand this. I know there's power and process, but get on, get, get on with it. You know, <laughs> let me pass this test. They look up at her, and you know what she does? She hovers over them. And the eagle span is about seven, sometimes nine feet. The big condors out in uh, California. And nine feet wingspan. Nine feet. Uh, this ceiling's probably 12, I'm guessing. Maybe a little more. But anyway, from the floor, probably more than halfway up that screen, and they'd never seen mama like that before. You're talking about impressive. She lets them know it's going to be okay. Have you ever had God tell you that? It's going to be all right. You're uncomfortable, but it's going to be okay. And then she does something. She sticks out one of those big, long pinions. And then according to the Bible and according to scientists and those who work in the field of the eagles... They grab on to that wing. And she lifts them off of those briars. And then she does this. She shakes them right back on it. Don't you love it when God answers prayer and then you find out, well, that's not totally over? It's a test, but it's an open book test. You can't fail. From Genesis to Revelation, the answers are there. It's already been given. She sticks her wing back out, and immediately they jump back on, and she shakes them right back off. She sticks it out, they come back on. You know what she's doing? She's removing fear from their life. 
This is mama. We can trust her. And then once immediately they hop back on, she does something that's really, they think really mom's really having some issues today because she soars with them into the heavens. Now they've never done that before. So, but I can imagine they're enjoying the ride. I've been there, haven't you? Haven't you been there? When Man, those that wait upon the Lord shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Well, it's all right when God's in control, right? But you know what she does? She takes that same big pinion and knocks them off. And then they start tumbling down. And can't you hear him? Mama, what did we do? Father God, what, are, what in the name of Jesus is going on? Instead of them screaming and crying, the best thing for them to do is start flying. But she don't let them fall because her eyesight is so keen. She swoops under them and they get right back on the wing. She doesn't go back to the nest anymore. She takes them higher and higher and higher. And then she shakes them off again until they learn how to fly. You ever felt like the bottom fell out? You ever felt like there was crises in your life that you didn't understand what was going on? Don't worry. You're the child of the Most High God. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. He'll go with you all the way even to the end of the world. He's there with you. And so when you learn how to fly, then after all the eaglets have passed the test, they come back and they have a learning lesson at the nest. They just do this. I must remember, I must remember, this is a teaching moment for mama and papa. And for the eaglets, this is what it's all about. And we know the rest of the story and I'll finish it at the end. So what's that got to do with Jacob? I've got about 15 minutes or so. So let me just talk about the children of Israel. I spoke about Jacob's life individually this morning. I'm going to go ahead and just talk about the children of Israel. Jacob, as you know, is the father of Joseph, as you know, who was the dreamer who went to Egypt, you know, and brought all the family down into Egypt. And when they came, it was a good thing. Man, I mean, it was good. Pharaoh knew Joseph. He saved all the land. He was second in command in all the land of the world. But then Exodus chapter 1 says this, And behold, Joseph died. And there arose another king who did not know Joseph or his mighty acts. And you know the first thing he did? Was start killing babies. Infanticide. He said, look at the Hebrews, look at these slaves. They're greater than we are. Their numbers outnumber us. And so we're going to start killing all the male children in the land. This went, this went on, I know, for at least probably 80 years. Moses was 40 years old when God revealed to him that he was going to be the leader of the children of Israel. So for 40 years, while Moses was living in the palace... For 40 years, they were dropping babies in the Nile and the crocodiles was eating the male Hebrew children. Moses was tired of it. He seen how they was treating the people of God. And so he saw one of the slave masters whip one of the Hebrew slaves and he killed that man. I always think, how did Moses feel when God, with his finger, said, Thou shalt not kill when he gave him the Ten Commandments? Probably had a little sting, don't you think? Moses had to flee. He ran from God for 40 years. All the time he's gone, they're killing babies. In fact, I believe it intensified because this is what God told Moses when he was at the burning bush. He didn't only say, well, take off your shoes, Moses. You're on holy ground. Remember what the words that he said? Listen to this. Most of us, most of us leaders would think, Tony, I've seen the, the leadership gifts in your life, and I'm going to bring you to my people to help my people. No, 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 no. You know what God said to Moses? I have heard the cry of my people in Egypt. And I'm going to send you to deliver them out of their bondage. See, it really had very little to do with Moses. But it had a whole lot to do with God and the cry of the people. 
And I believe if there's ever been a day when the cry of the babies that have been killed in this nation and around the, around the world is coming up before God, it's now. Can you imagine the cries of those that they just passed in, on the Senate floor last week that they can kill them after they're born alive? You know, if not a sparrow falls from heaven that the Lord don't see it, what about the uh, Imagio Dei, the person who's in the image of God being murdered by a doctor who takes a hypocritical oath? That's what it's called. It's a hypocritical oath. If you're a doctor in this room today and something happens to me, you are obligated by the oath that you took to do everything in your power to save my life. If that mother that I laid my hands on her stomach and prophesied over that baby in her womb this morning would give a premature birth in this sanctuary, that doctor would be required by law to deliver that baby and make sure that baby was taken care of. But last week, we stooped to an all-time low in the United States of America by passing a law in the Congress that they can kill a child even after it's born. They lit up the Brooklyn Bridge and the memorial building, the 9-11 memorial building in pink to celebrate women being able to kill their children after they were born. Say, God help us. And you know what? It's time for you as a Christian to let your voice be heard. The gays came out of the closet back in the 60s. Don't you think it's time for the church to come out of their closet? Would somebody give God one of these right here? Come on, I want you to praise the Lord. So the cry of those mothers and of those babies being eaten by crocodiles came up before the Lord. And God said, I'm sending you. So Moses goes. Guess what? It gets worse. How many of you know sometimes it has to get worse before it gets better? Boy, you're a prophet of God, aren't you? Yeah. Sometimes things have to get worse before they get better. I'm going to tell you right now, God's people think persecution is when our restaurant's closed on Sunday. I went to celebrate my birthday at Cheesecake Factory with my son and his wife and our grandbaby. And while we were sitting there, I saw all the fire trucks and the police officers outside. They closed the restaurant. We, we think that's persecution today. The difference between the New Testament and the day that we live in right now. In the, in, listen to this. When I give an altar call, this is how I do it. If you want to come and live for Jesus and give your life to him, come up here. I'm going to say the sinner's prayer with you, and you're going to live for Jesus. Jesus is going to come into your life, and it's the greatest thing that will ever happen to you, and it is. But in the New Testament, when they gave an altar call, this is what they said. Who wants to die for him? See, people perform at the level they're recruited at. Did you know that? That's a leadership principle. Yeah, I'm a motivational speaker. I may not sound like one right now, but I, I, I try to motivate people. I try to help people. But we've motiv motivated people right into hell. And I think it's time that we turn that around. You and I as God's people have to recruit people at the level we expect of them. And that is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. You count your life as nothing and Jesus as everything. Well, I got three people that's willing to join. One said amen, two Presbyterians shook their head. I am 58 years old, and I don't have time to play games. My grandchildren's life depend on me getting it right. Do you hear me? People are counting on us. And so it's going to get worse before it gets better. You know what we'll do when a pastor does good in a town? We'll give him the key to the city. Do you know what they've done to the men in the New Testament? They gave them the best jail cell they had in the city. A little different, isn't it? See we, see, we see things through modern eyes and God sees things through God's eyes. God didn't call me to be celebrated. He called me to die. I, I, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. Listen, we shouldn't think more highly of ourselves than we ought. The next verse says, but soberly. 
Because we're all members of one body. Therefore, I can't exalt myself above you. You can't exalt yourself above me. We're in this thing together and we got to get it right. So here's Moses. I'll get back to my story. He comes on the scene. Those people have been crying. They've been on the briars for 80 years. And they'd never seen God so big when Moses stepped into town. He called down ten plagues on the land of Egypt. They had, they had never seen God hover over them like that before. What a mighty... We used to sing... Uh, when I first came to the church of God, we used to sing... Remember that old song? What a mighty God we serve? We wore it out. I mean, you know... Just like chewing on steak. What a mighty God we serve. He made himself big to his people. And he led them out. Psalms 116 says they were glad when they left. They plundered Egypt. They took all the silver and gold that was in that land with them. And there wasn't a sick person among them. There wasn't a feeble person among all the Hebrew people the day they walked out of the land of Egypt. God did not want them to stay in Goshen. God had prepared a promised land that flowed with milk and honey. God didn't want me to stay in the Baptist church. God wanted me to be where I am today. And listen, I don't know where God wants me to be tomorrow. But I'll tell you what I do know. I'm going to get there. Do you hear me? Because because I follow his leading. I know he protects me. The Holy Ghost is on the inside of me. And wherever he tells me to go, that's where I'm headed. I have people talking to me all the time about retirement and, you know, this position that I serve in. And I'm honored to serve. Very few men get to serve in the position that I serve in. And I know that. It is a very high position. There's only about 55 or 56 of us in the church of God that are state overseers. But I'm here to tell you right now, God called me to do what I do. And I love this church and I love our denomination. But I love my God and He's in charge of my life. And if He don't go with me, I'm not going. Come on, somebody praise the Lord with me. Come on, everybody praise the Lord. You can do better than that. The last thing that the mother does and the father eagle does is they go to the highest cleft of the mountain. What are they doing there? Well, I'm glad you asked. They await the storm. How many of you know that you were not made to go through storms? I hear people say, well, I'm doing really good under the circumstances. Well, wh what are you doing under there? God didn't call me to be under the circumstances. Listen, if you got a message for the devil, write it right there. On the bottom of your foot. The last time I checked, the grave couldn't hold down the God that I serve. How about you? So if you got a message to the devil, write it on your shoe. You were made to be above the storms of life. Well, how does that happen? Storms are coming. Say storms are coming. Well, you go to the highest place that you can get, and then that mother does this. She sets her wings. I was out west. It is nothing for there to be a headwind of 120 mile an hour. That jet stream that brings all this wonderful weather we're having, when it soars through the plains and across the Rocky Mountains, it comes with vengeance and with a force. So she's waiting on that wind. And when that 120 mile an hour wind hits the breast of that eagle, it lifts her above the storm. She never goes through a storm. She is always over the storm. And that's how God created you to be. Stand with me. That'll make you think about storms differently, won't it? Of course, I have another message I do when storms come out of the book of Acts. 
What to do if you find yourself in a storm. You're never to find yourself in a storm. But what do you do if you find yourself in a storm? That's another message for another day. See, when you're above the storm and the lightning is flashing and the thunder is roaring, it looks totally different than when you're on the bottom side of that storm. I love to fly. I do. My wife doesn't love to fly, but I do. I enjoy flying. Why? Because I don't care how cloudy it is on the earth. I don't care if there's rain, sleet, snow, or hail. When I break through the clouds, the sun, the S-U-N, and the S-O-N is always shining.